Welcome back to Inside Personal Growth. This is Greg Voice and the host of Inside Personal Growth. And Barry is joining me. Are you in Palm Beach, Florida today, Barry? I am, although All it's right. a bit rainy, but I'm here. All right, well, you made it there. He's normally in New Jersey and New York. And Barry Habib is our guest uh, this morning. And Barry, I wanna thank you for being on Inside Personal Growth and sharing some of your insights and wisdom about his new book, which his head is covering it in the back, but I'm gonna have him hold up a copy, Money in the Streets. Um, this is a great book. He has lots of accolades from some very interesting people, including Tony Robbins um, and Randy Zuckerberg. But Barry, I'm gonna let our listeners know a tad bit about you um, before we get into the questions about the book. Barry is an American entrepreneur and a frequent media resources for his mortgage and housing expertise. He's the CEO of MBS Highway, the industry's most highly regarded and recognized tool for transforming sales per people into advisors. Barry is a two-time Crystal Ball Award winner for 2018 and 2020 for the most uh, accurate real estate forecasts out of 150 of the top economists in the U.S. Barry was also named 2019 Mortgage Professional of the Year by National Mortgage Professional Magazine and was 2019 finalist for the prestigious Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year. He is the lead producer and managing partner. You can see his sign in the corner of his desk over there for Rock of Ages and 27th longest running show on Broadway history. He's also produced Chris Angel's Mind Freak at Planet Hollywood in Vegas. Well, Barry, this book had a lot of appeal to me and I'm sure it's gonna have a lot of appeal to the listeners as well. And, you know, I love the stories that you weaved into the book and the stories tell a lot about you, but they also tell a lot about what you wanna share with the listeners. And, you know, right in the introduction, you tell a great story about the trip to Santa Fe, New Mexico from New Jersey to do a speaking event. And you're complaining the whole time about how it long it takes to get from New Jersey to Santa Fe and book the flights and all the connecting flights and all that. And you were doing this for free, by the way. Um, so, but the story also exemplifies the opportunities that are really everywhere, which is really what this book is talking about. There's money in the streets. You know, you can find opportunity anywhere if you're willing to go that extra mile. And I think that's what it's about. Can you tell this great little story that sets the stage really kind of for the rest of the book? Yeah, Greg. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. And I'm so glad that you and I have got a chance to become friends and connect on here. And your story is really interesting as well. So thank you for sharing it with me. And, you know, I feel like we're kind of kindred spirits here. And, and Greg, uh, can I tell you, not only was I so humbled by putting this book out and I got the book in my hands for the first time last week, right? And I have to tell you, I don't mind saying it was kind of emotional for me to kind of finally see that together. But then over the weekend, the publisher sends me this link on Amazon and it hit number one on the bestseller list on the new releases. So I was like, oh my goodness. So uh, I am so grateful. And that's a lot about what this book is about. It's about gratitude and understanding how fortunate we are and having a positive mindset and an optimistic mindset. And so many years ago, as a, as a professional speaker, and I've been doing that for more years than I want to admit, it's a little less than 30 years that I've been a professional speaker, but you know, I have a good heart and I want to help people out. And someone asked me for a favor to do this. They were launching a business. They wanted me to be the headline speaker there. It was in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And man, it's a pain in the butt to get there, Greg. So I, I wasn't feeling well. Now, I didn't realize it at the time, but I had diverticulitis and I was having an attack and I didn't understand why I was in such pain. But I really like pulled myself to do it because I made the commitment she was counting on me and all these all these people that were going to be at the event. So I really sucked it up for the long trip there. And, you know, I guess that God rewarded me with this because after doing the talk, yeah, I met so many nice people. It was a great crowd. And boy, I tell you what, Greg, when I got to the hotel, the hotel was kind of dingy, man. So the cost of the hotel room. $25 for the room. And you asked the guy to charge you more. Because I, you I said, how, all right. I said, wait a second, how much is it? 25? I said, just, just charge me a little more. So I feel good about this experience, you know? And he says, no, it's 25 bucks. And guess what? He says, here's a dollar back coupon to get a beer for free. I was like, oh no. Well, uh, you know what? 
it was a good thing. I just kind of went for it because like you said, and like the book talks about opportunities are everywhere. And, um, you know, whenever I speak, whatever the situation is, I try not to think about me. You know what I think about? I think about the person in the audience who got up earlier that day, who maybe isn't doing the things that were on their list or is sacrificing other things that they were going to be doing so they could spend time with me and hear me speak. So I take it really seriously, Greg. I want to do everything I can to make it worthwhile for that person, to show them that the time that they spent with me was really worth the sacrifices and the effort that they made. So happened to do a pretty good job and people came up to me like they always do afterwards, but there were three people in particular. One was a lovely gal, beautiful gal, Cindy Ertman. And she's just gone on to do so many things in the mortgage industry now as a leader. And, and I got a chance to be friends with her and coach her and mentor her. And so that was this, you know, now 20 year friendship. And another one was a guy by the name of Jack Long. And Jack really liked my talk. And he said, you know, Barry, you really showed these different things that people don't talk about with how to do financing and how they can use the money. And maybe mortgage insurance is not a bad thing because everybody was poo-pooing it. And he was the head of the largest mortgage insurance company in the United States. He said, Barry, I love your talk so much. I want to sponsor you on a national tour. And he did so for four years. And that really helped me in other ways. And then the other guy was a guy by the name of Kurt Warner, not the football player, but Kurt, he said, wow, this is really amazing what you're talking about here. And we started talking and he said that what he did was he had a company and back in the day, there was a lot of these auto dial companies where, you know, you record right. a message and you get, yeah. a lot of times political people would use it during yeah. campaign. I know it's a pain in the butt, these things, but there's a good way that we could use it too. And I always had this idea about telling people in the mortgage industry how when interest rates change that you know we have the ability to kind of know that but i didn't have a mass way to get that out there back then we're thinking about faxes and they're not always effective but here we could dial your cell phone or call your office by recording one message and having it sent out immediately and a light bulb went in my head after talking to them i said wow this could be a great opportunity and i launched the company called Mortgage Market Guide, which became ubiquitous within the mortgage industry, it had 30,000 paying subscribers and wound up selling it for a lot of money um, seven years later. So here's something I didn't even want to go to, Greg. And right. everything was pointing against it. I did not feel well, but because I gave my best effort, because I networked with people, because I spent time to get to know them and ask questions and was interested in them, those opportunities presented themselves to me with friendships and, you know, Cindy's doing so many great things in the mortgage industry. I mean, it's all her, she gets all the credit, but I feel good that I was able to have a small part in her mentorship. And Jack Long really helped me to build Mortgage Market Guide. And Kurt gave me the idea to start Mortgage Market Guide and to build that and take him on as a partner. It's just amazing what's right in front of us. It is, and, and, and that story is just so, so exemplifies going the extra mile and the money in the streets, you know, the people in the audience that you connected with, the connections they made and what they turned into. A real quick story is um, Larry Wilson from Wilson Learning was somebody who had the biggest training center in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And Larry and I would talk very similar and he'd say, well, come on out to the center because I want you to get here. And it was raining cats and dogs and I drove through the mud and he says, I want you to co-author a book with me. And, and the, you know, the, so the answer to the story there is great. Now you speak about random nature of rejection, which we all face from time to time. Uh, you state that you were not born in the, what you call the silver spoon club. And, and neither was I. I mean, it sounds like we had very similar families. Can you tell our listeners about your family life and why being born into your family really was a blessing. Um, I well, think we need to look for those blessings. Well, and that'll tie into the title of the book too. And first, you know, Greg, um, I think you and I, when we first had talked, and one of the reasons why I felt like I had such a great connection with you is because we both feel that one of the important things to do is, yeah, you know, we all have to have goals, right? We all want to make sure that we set that. And it's very important to set goals, keep raising the bar. And you have to have a, des de yeah, a destination. We talk about in the book, you know, you don't, you don't put in a destination into your GPS based upon where there's the least traffic. You need to have a destination. And if you go through traffic, 
Well, you have to figure out best ways to navigate that. In life, it's the same. You need to have goals. You need to have a destination. And if there's traffic, if there's obstacles, you have to get around them. But the name of the book, Money in the Streets, comes from the fact that when so many immigrants came here, my parents were immigrants and they came from Europe. My ancestry is from Spain. And while my family is not Turkish, they lived in Turkey for many generations. It was very difficult. And they came here at a time where the Turkish government took everything they had. My parents were both intelligent, but my mom never went to school. So she didn't read or write. They were older. And they came here and the government took everything they had. They were really poor. My dad had to humble himself from being an international journalist in Turkey to working at a hot dog stand. And because my mom had to make, make money to help support the household, she worked in a sweatshop where they make dresses. My oldest brother, Norm, he did what he could as a young teenager, but whatever money he made went to the household to contribute to bills. Just a very different lifestyle. So now they discovered, guess what? Mom's pregnant with me. So good for my old man for still being kind of active at his age, right? So good for him. But um, he was 57. Mom was 40. They were broke. Didn't speak the language. And now here's a baby on the way. Now, what's interesting about the way I was conceived is I was conceived in 1959. The reason why that's important is because birth control became available in 1960. So I kind of just slid in there. And then, Greg, to top it off, abortion was not legal back then. It was pre Roe v. Wade. So I kind of just slid in there and listen, maybe that's the reason why I want to try and make the most of this is because this for me is kind of like bonus time, right? So um, we talk about the word random in the first chapter because random is the way we all come into this world. It's the most random event we will ever have because we don't pick it. We don't pick the year. We don't pick the family. We don't pick the circumstances. And with me, my parents were very, very poor, so their challenges became instantly my challenges. Now, my mom and dad were distraught, and they were distraught when they found out that they were going to have me, as anyone would be. I don't blame them for this. And that's the thing about when you have rejection. You know, you shouldn't think it's always about you. It's the circumstances, so don't let it get you down. If you're feeling rejected, doesn't mean it's you. It could just be the circumstances. So don't let it get to you. But when my parents wanted to, you know, have abortion, they couldn't do it. When they were wondering what to do, my mom, who worked in the sweatshop one day, was crying. And her boss, Emma, who owned the shop with her husband, Joe, saw she was crying. She says, Karina, why are you crying? And she said, well, you know, we're, we're, we don't speak the language. We're broke. We're older. You know, my, my husband's 57. You know, we're going to have a baby now. We've got two other kids to take care of. We don't know what to do. And she was crying. And Emma, who could never have kids, offered her everything to have the baby. She said, you have the baby and give it to me. I can never have a baby. I'll go away. I'll give you money. I'll even give you the business. And my mom came to the revelation that, oh, my God, what she had was a blessing, not something to be upset about. Because here's someone that would give everything to have what my mom already had. And of course, my mom would have never gone for it, but it changed her mindset. And I think, Greg, that a lot of this book has to do with the mindset that we have. Because while everything else is random, your mindset is truly within your control. And that's the thing about when you take a look at fulfillment and doing for others. You want to have success. You want to have goals. But fulfillment comes from helping other people and doing good. There's a lot of people that are very famous or very wealthy or very successful, but they're very unhappy. And I think that you have to have fulfillment. And that typically comes from doing good for other people and seeing them do well, along with those successful goals, to have something that approaches happiness. That's just what I, the way I feel about it. Now, you know what's interesting? One last thing on that story. Emma came to the house years later and she saw me as kind of a young man and she turned to my mom and she said you know Karina you made the right decision so kind of a nice story it is it's a very nice story and you know I I think that you know as you say randomness happens all the time every day we're having something random that comes in and uh, we don't have control over it and it's how you approach it from your mindset um, you can make it positive or you can choose to 
you know, bump along the negative path and you don't do that. And that's what I like about you. And that's why my show is called Inside Personal Growth. Now you spoke about being at Tony Robbins event and Tony came over to you and he said, very Habib, a very successful guy, uh, but he will have hardships and suffer too. Um, the best way to move through the challenges we face is to have what Tony calls a beautiful mindset. We were just talking about that. Can you speak with our listeners about cultivating what he's referring to and you're referring to as this beautiful mindset? Because it's, it's one thing to tell our listeners a story like what you just told. It's another thing to give them actionable steps that they could take to cultivate this beautiful mindset. And that's what I'd like for you to impart on them now. Yes, yeah, so Tony and I um, have spoken at a lot of events together and we've become actually really good friends. I cherish the fact that um, I'm, I'm friends with Tony. And as a matter of fact, this just a few days from now, this Saturday, we're gonna be spending some time together. And I always learn from him. Uh, he is just this incredible human being. And one thing that Tony did help me that I want to share with all of you, and he gets full credit for this, is called the 90 second rule. So Greg, things are going to upset us. Things are going to piss us off, whether it's somebody cuts you off on the road or this or that, it's going to happen. And what that can do is change your mindset into the negative. And then not only are we upset, not only are we taking away from us, but we're also going to reflect that on other people because we're pissed off and we're going to have that crappy attitude. Tony says, we're human, we're gonna get pissed. But within 90 seconds, what our job to do is to switch that around and don't let it steal not only our joy, but don't let it steal the joy that we can bring other people, Greg. And I really have practiced that for a long time where I try and snap out of it. You know, I'll, I'll get pissed, I'll maybe be short, maybe I'll say whatever, but then 90 seconds later, if I can, within 90 seconds, sometimes I don't do the best job, but I try to pretty quickly, Greg, switch that around, take a deep breath, oftentimes apologize, and try and bring joy to others. Keep that beautiful mindset. And I think if we all just try that, and one of the other things I do to really cultivate that is I start every morning with gratitude. Every day, I begin my day typically right after a cup of coffee and I go through and I actually say it out loud, all the things that I'm so blessed and grateful for, my health, the opportunities I have, the wonderful things I have, my wonderful family, all the good things, all the prayers that have been answered, all the, all the things that I have, all of the things that you know, I want to focus on because if we just focus on the negative, you know, it's kind of like when you're driving your car. If your focus is in one direction because that's where you're looking, that's where you're going to go. So if we focus on the negative, and I'm not saying, you know, live in a dream world, okay, you have to address problems, but focus on the opportunities, exactly. focus on the positive, and they will come to you. Yeah, it's, and, you know, it's an easy thing to do, you know, when you swing your legs outside of the bed, or even before they get outside of the bed, just repeat the affirmation of the things you're grateful for before you take that first walk to the bathroom. You know, that's my little routine. And I, I go back a long way with Tony as well. And I'm going to pick something up real quick and just show you here. <laughs> you see this? <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> so um, the reality is, is that he helps people, you help people get on track. And that's what that's about. Now, I want to talk about a really important thing that happened in your life and mine as well. So I, I really related to the story. When you're 11 years old, your father had a heart attack and you and I have this story in common. Uh, mine started at seven and my dad ultimately died at 53 when I was 18 and I was in the hospital at the same time, just like you. Um, can you tell our listeners about your intuition that guided you back to his room to say goodbye? Because you were at the elevator door. And the significance of this event that changed your life forever and helped you to build resilience. So what advice would you have, would you give the listeners who are facing these life challenging events and how to deal with them? I think I told you before, just three weeks ago, I had to be the one to pull the plug on one of my brothers. So I lost a brother and I look at finitude and you see finitude, every one of us, that's one thing we all have in common is finitude. 
and no matter how hard we work, but you have to put this in perspective spiritually. And I think your resilience and your spirituality is a really important part. And I think uh, you have a lesson for people to learn from this story. So I, I am very spiritual, you know, not so much religious, but very spiritual. You know, I begin every day with prayer. I believe it works. I truly do. And I, I think that, you know, going back to when I was a little boy, I had a very uncertain, un unfortunate circumstance. Um, at age 11, my, my dad passed away. And there's a lot of folks like you, Greg, who have had these unfortunate circumstances. So my dad had a heart attack. I was too young to even know what, what a heart attack really meant. But I remember as a family, we went to go visit him in the hospital and he seemed okay. And you know, maybe the heart attack wasn't that bad. I mean, it seemed okay. But I don't know, just something was just in the back of my mind. And as my family left the room, we all went to the elevator. And as we hit the button for the elevator, I just couldn't take the next step. I said, I'll be right back. And this is just an 11 year old kid completely on my own. I didn't even ask permission. I ran as fast as I could to my dad's room. And I just saw him there lying there. And something said, you have to say goodbye one more time. And I said, goodbye, daddy. And that was the last time I ever saw him. So. The lesson that I learned that day was trust your gut. If you feel something, if you, if something is telling you inside, and we've all had that, we've all had that, but we suck it down. We don't pay it any mind. And then later on, we regret it. What I want to just try and share is that when you feel that, please listen to it. And that's a lesson that I learned that day. And it's really helped me my whole life to just when something doesn't feel right, don't dismiss it. Don't say, oh, it's nothing or it's just me. It's not. There's something yeah. that's telling you. The universe is telling you. You have, you have it inside you. You're more sensitive and more miraculous than you know. There are other things at work. Listen, because we don't understand something, Greg, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Look, I had, he's gone now, but I had the most amazing, brilliant golden retriever, smartest dog people had ever seen. Okay, this dog was almost human, no matter how smart this dog was, if I showed him an Excel spreadsheet, he couldn't make heads or tails of it. So just because he didn't understand it doesn't mean that the Excel spreadsheet doesn't exist and doesn't mean it doesn't, doesn't have a function and works. So put us in the position of that golden retriever, as smart as we think we are, just because we don't understand it doesn't mean it's not there and it's not working in the universe we get these glimpses that we could just tap into just very briefly that are hints for us to totally. know that something is there. Right. And we have to pay that mind. We have to honor that and pay that mind because if we do, the results for us are incredible. Intuition, uh, anybody who's been in business and has been in business long enough uh, learns how to tap their intuition and learns how to listen to the soul's calling. And I think the soul is something that a lot of people, unfortunately, have a tendency to kind of neglect. Um, they, they don't believe in it. But truly, some of the biggest decisions that Steve Jobs made and Warren Buffett and uh, all of the greats that have been out there, um, Bill Gates, they'll talk to you about intuition. And I think you need to listen to it. So throughout your early career, you sold everything from calculators to stereo equipment. Um, and you know, it's funny, I was reading your book and I'm like, it's like me, I was a fuller brush salesman as a kid in Boy Scouts. I sold the most Christmas cards. I sold the most fuller brush. I was a door to door peddler guy of all kinds of stuff. Right. And I was in the insurance business, everything, you name it. But what is it about having a career in sales that you knew was going to set you free? Because you know, you saw something different that some people, not everybody sees this in sales. I did, you did, um, but it did set you free. So there's two really important lessons that I learned early on in sales. One is sales is very fair because I loved sports. I lived for sports. My dream was to be an athlete. I wanted to, and I was actually pretty good. I wasn't great. I was pretty good. And I was good enough to make the high school teams. I was good enough to be competitive. But as I got to the collegiate level, it seemed like other people got better than I did. And I wasn't able to make it. And it wasn't because of lack of trying. First to practice, last to leave, practiced at home, studied, just everything. Just wasn't good enough. God did not have that in the plan for me. It just wasn't there for me. I didn't have the God-given talent. So athletics 
yes, it has to do with a lot of effort, but it's got to be with God-given skill. Sales, on the other hand, is very fair. Sales is something that depends on one thing and one thing only. And that's this right here, part. How much do you want it? How much are you willing to sacrifice? The more you put in, the more you get out. The more effort, the more the result. You don't have to be faster. You don't have to jump higher. You don't have to bench press 300 pounds. All you need is one thing, and that's heart and desire. And if you're willing to do that, you can be extraordinarily successful in anything you want to do in life, and especially sales. Now, one other thing I learned from sales. And I learned that when bad things happen, Greg, that it shows you opportunities. Most of us don't want bad things to happen. And yeah, I understand. We don't want to plan for that. But every time something goes wrong, you have the opportunity to shine and rise to the occasion. When something would go wrong in sales and something wouldn't work or something like in the early days when I was selling stereos out of the trunk of my car, I'd be this kid running around all you know, New York City, Brooklyn, New York, Staten Island, right, Queens. And sometimes something would go wrong. There wasn't cell phones. So I leave this answering service number because that's the only people get in touch with me. They probably thought they'd never seen me again, this kid out of the trunk of his car. But they would call, leave a message. I would call back and I would make sure I went there to either exchange or fix the problems. People were so blown away that what they did was they felt obligated, like, oh my gosh, you came all the way out of it. I got to buy more or I got to tell somebody to buy from you. And you built these lifelong relationships that are based on trust and trust is everything. And while people may trust you, they'll really trust you if something goes wrong and you fix it mm -hmm. and go out of your way to do what's right when you could go the other way. Yeah. So when things go wrong, don't look at that as a negative. Realize that this is your chance to shine. This is your chance to build a relationship. This is your chance to build your career, your reputation. Things going wrong sometimes can be the best thing that happens to you. So true. So true. And we all have so many stories about uh, salespeople who sold us something where there's the side of the person, the people that never showed back up again, and the ones that gave the best customer service conceivably possible. And, you know, it's, it's almost like doing something for free. You know, you come back to fix something and people, I know there's a sense of this because people sell things off the internet this way. They give away a lot for free. And then ultimately you go, guess what? I'm going to buy what this course this guy has because he gave me all this stuff for free. And I think that psychologically uh, it, it does, it's a, it's a methodology that works, but more importantly, if it's in your heart and you really want to make it right by somebody, they read that very well. Now you speak about- yeah, Greg, Greg, Greg you, you can judge someone's character by how they would treat someone else who can absolutely not do anything to benefit them. Exactly. How do they respect them? How do they treat them? What do they do for someone just out of kindness, out of respect, out of knowing the right thing to do and lifting someone else up? And I've got to tell you something about that too, is that while you might do it selflessly, it's almost selfish because the feeling that you get from knowing that you did something good, that feeling of fulfillment, it really does wonders for the way we feel about ourselves. And, and that's part of happiness. Well, and you can tell the uh, leadership of an organization by the kind of customer service people that they've hired and trained to do that work. I don't care if it's a computer repair or something that went wrong at, with your Google product or your Microsoft, but if you get, if you can see how good those customer service people are, that is a key. Now you speak about the strategies for seizing opportunity at our feet and you list a bunch of them in the book. What are some of these strategies that you'd like to inform the listeners about and that can help them seize opportunity? Um, you had many in the book, you can pick a few of them and say, okay, here's some of them we'd like to talk about. But um, I'd love for you to talk about the strategies of seizing so, opportunity. So first of all, the name money in the streets, right? So what does that mean? When immigrants come here, they hear that America is such a rich country. There's literally money in the streets. All you got to do is pick it up, right? So then they come here and they become disillusioned. And my parents were no different. And they told me these stories when I was a kid. Like, you know, huh, we thought there were money in the streets. We thought it was such rich. And it was kind of funny, but it was really sad. And then later, as I started to discover these things, as I started to discover building trust, as I started to discover talking to everyone and telling them what you do, 
will uncover opportunities. As I started to discover attending gatherings and not going there and being a wallflower or staying with whom you came with, by actually trying to meet people and understand them and learn from them. And look, there's an old saying, if you want to be interesting, be interested. By being interested in them. I mean, heck, I've had times where I've sat on the plane next to somebody and struck up a conversation and it wound up being a relationship or a friendship. And the other thing that I really discovered is that if you want to make life really special with relationships, don't start by asking. Start by offering. Start by giving. If you have the heart and the mindset of how can I help you and what can I do for you and what resources that I have, can I do to give something special to you? Not everyone, you have to be okay with this, but many, many times they will want to reciprocate. And that's what makes your life so special. And of that comes these opportunities. And as we tie it together with trusting your gut and being able to kind of see the other thing too, Greg, is we got to, we have to think big, you know, we have to think big. And somebody who taught me this was a guy by the name of Jack Rummett, who really opened up my eyes to thinking big. You know, the analogy that I like to use is now I do like I do like nice cars, fast cars. I like to drive on the track and I like to make sure that I do so correctly. So I've had many, many, many lessons. And one of the best lessons a driving instructor gave me was simple, but critically important to all of us. And he said, most people, when they drive, if you even catch yourself, most of us look at the car in front of us as we're driving. That's the natural thing to do. But that's actually the wrong place to be looking. You should be looking much further down the road. And if you want a great example of this, just take a bottle of water, right? Take, take, take a bottle of water and put it about 15 or 20 feet in front of you on the ground if you're outside. And when you do, look at the bottle of water and then try and see a sign up ahead. You probably can't see it. But if you look at the sign, you can definitely see the bottle of water. Now, if you do this while you're driving, you'll definitely become a much better driver, a much safer driver, and be able to avoid some bad things that could happen. And if you're trying to drive you know, on, on the track, you'll be able to handle that much, much better. But if you do it in life, well, then you're gonna bring so much more success because you'll be seeing it. Most of us look this far and focus this far. If we focus here, we still get this, but now this all opens up to us. And That's if you really, really and if you really want to get good, you put the bottle of water around the corner and you see the bottle of water around the corner. <laughs> because the reality is, is if you can start to see around corners, you can start to see what's coming, right? And seeing around corners is really about putting all the dots together and really looking at opportunities. And you're a guy I know that sees around corners because people are kind of forecasting the future are the ones that are gonna actually make that future happen. And it does take a little bit of extra work. Now in your chapter on mapping dreams, you stay, you don't just set goals, you know, figure out how to achieve them. You speak about reverse engineering everything. Now I love this because in a book that I just did that Napoleon Hill Foundation sponsored called Think and Grow Through Art and Music. I'm gonna give a shout out to Randy Faulkner. Uh, Pharrell Williams was one of the people he interviewed for the book and Pharrell didn't really make big time thing until he was like in his forties. Right. Um, and he said he always reverse engineered his whole life. He saw himself first having the success before he got the success. So talk to us about that because you've obviously used the same technique, very successful in your life. So yeah, I mean, uh, listen, all of us might not be where we want to be right now, but it doesn't mean you have to stay there, okay? So that, let's just understand that. Everyone, if you're in, in a place that maybe you're, you're not exactly where you want to be, you don't have to stay there. That's your choice, your mindset. And just like you get in your car and you're going someplace, the first thing you do is you enter the destination. So you have to really focus on that destination. And then the GPS almost never is a straight shot there. There's right. turns, there's changes. You get on the highway for this, then you get on this road, then you're going to make a left here that... That's the way it is in life. So, but if you could see the destination, then what you have to do is focus on all of the steps that need to get there. And look, if you don't know the answers, that's okay. Find them. All of you are resourceful. You can find mentors. And the book talks about how to find mentors. You could find people that have done it. You can do your own research. Google's an amazing tool. Reading's an amazing thing to be able to do. So if you are able to 
take them in steps, then all you want to do is just like for a GPS. Well, the first thing I have to do this, maybe it's learning the skill or getting the basic knowledge of it. Then, okay, then maybe there's a license required, or maybe there's some of the things that you have to do to cultivate the clients or the expertise. And step by step by step, just stay on your path. Stay within that GPS. Keep doing all those things. And you can't help but get there. You cannot help it. You will have to get there. Well, you will get there. And, um, it, and in, along that line, we all make mistakes. And you have a whole chapter here about, you speak about your failed marriages in this chapter on learning from your mistakes. And that some, many of your ex-wives are still, you know, your best friends. Um, why is making mistakes so important? And what mindset should people adopt about the mistakes that they make in life so that they can become, I would just want to say more open, resilient, you know, mistakes. I, I mean, like you, I've made hundreds of big mistakes that have cost millions of dollars in my life. Um, and probably you too. But if you oh, yeah. don't, if you don't, if you're not willing to make the mistake, then you're not willing to learn. You know, I think the key is don't make the mistake twice. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, you know, in, in the marriage, I did make it twice because my, my, yeah. but my two, ex, my, my, my ex. So look at the kids you have as a result. Right. So the kids, yeah. the kids are amazing kids. You know, Dan yeah. and Nicole from my first marriage and Marianne, who we're still friends with. We spend Thanksgiving together because it, I, I don't believe in having, you know, if relationships that don't work out doesn't mean that there wasn't love there, and it doesn't mean that the person's not a good person. It just it just means that for whatever the reason was, and sometimes it's my responsibility of what had happened. You know, certainly my second marriage with Tony, it was really my fault. You know, I was too wrapped up in work and this and that, and I was out of balance. So you try to learn from these things. But Jake and Jared, they came out of it. We're just are they are amazing, amazing people and kids and good human beings. So you know, and Tony and I are best friends. You know, we we talk very often. We help each other. We, you know, it's it's. It doesn't have to be, you know, that love is always going to be there. You don't have to, you know, make it so that it's ugly. I, don't, I never wanted to show my kids that or teach them that lesson. I wanted to teach my kids that, look, people make mistakes. I made mistakes. And in business, it's the same thing. You know, you're going to make mistakes. I've made so many mistakes. But I do try and consider it as if I'm paying tuition, you know, learning from this. And right. the, the, the big thing is to try and get better from it. The big thing is try, try and get better from the mistakes you're making. Now, sometimes we do make the same mistake twice, but at least try to get better. Try to take lessons from it. So don't be afraid to take a chance or, or, or whatever it is in business, because it's not always going to work out. But make sure you can tolerate the worst that could happen and label it too. You know, just, just talk about it. If it happens, here's what it's going to be like. What, what will it be? The sun's going to come up. You know, if it works out, this is what it's going to be. If it doesn't work out, this is what it's going to be. Can I tolerate that? And if you can, then go for it. Right. And not, and don't be risk averse. You yeah. Know, you I have mean, to take risks. You I, have I, to. I think that, you know, you can, you can weigh out the risk and decide which risks are, are good for you, but you can't be risk averse because not everything in life is certain. And so that uncertainty, just like COVID has brought to so many people, you know, you look at this and there's a tremendous blessing that's happening to so many people as a result of what we are actually all going through. Yet there's some people that just focus on the negative. Oh, you know, it's the, the right. masks oh, and this and that. But it oh, has oh. been really, a, I mean, look what we're doing um, before this. Uh, honestly, we go back to March, we weren't doing as many Zoom interviews. We were doing a lot of audio interviews. Now Zoom has become like, the, hey, this is all we're going to do is yeah. Zoom, right? Yeah. And, and Greg, that, that COVID is really the epitome of something bad becoming an opportunity, right? Yeah. So yeah. You know, this is clearly not something we want. Not, it, it, the, the sooner we can get rid of this darn thing, the better. I agree. But, but those of us who are looking at it and saying, okay, there's friction here. How do we step up? What can we do to help others? How do we alleviate those points of friction? And those are the opportunities. That's what I did when I started Mortgage Market Guide. In the mortgage business, people were getting hurt because rates were moving intraday and clients were getting upset because the rates were going up, mortgage professionals were lost. So I created something to alleviate that by creating a system that would alert them. With Rock of Ages, I would watch and I would just observe. And people would come to my show and I would see them get there. It's in New York City. So they would get there a little bit late. 
They wanted to get an adult beverage. They waited online. By the time they got their drink for 16 bucks, the lights would flicker, ding, ding, time to get there. And you could not bring your drink to the seats. So I'd watch these people like guzzle their drinks. I was like, why do we have to do that? Why don't we let them drink in the seats? I said, no, on Broadway, it's not allowed. Well, Greg, if you know me, you know, we've never done that before is not a satisfactory answer. So I fought and fought and fought. And I became the first show in the history of Broadway to allow drinking in the seats. So people have better experience. Now they all do it. When I had a medical imaging business, I know, and I hope to God nobody ever has to go through the anxiety of waiting for the results of your scan. Now, you know the tech knows the deal, but the tech can't talk to you, okay? And so your mind's your worst enemy. You get upset, you have anxiety, tough to sleep. So I said, why do people have to do that? Let's put a radiologist right there on site. By the time you get trust, if it's great news, you walk out of there great. If it's not, you have a plan. And that's what people need is a plan. Don't let the anxiety play on you. Help them see what's next. Help them make progress. And progress is really a, a word that's associated with happiness. Look, maybe you want to lose 20 pounds, but if you lose seven, you're happier, okay? You're not at your goal, but you're happier. And that's what we want to try and do is help people make progress. So as I alleviated this point of friction, all these businesses did extraordinarily well. And you can do this in your life. When you see a point of friction, think about how can I alleviate this and then take it and think big. Such good advice. It's great advice. Uh, Money in the Streets is a great book. Now let's wrap up our interview with this question. If you were to leave the listeners with three action steps um, that they could take right now to change their lives and to seize opportunity. So an action step that they could seize opportunity with. How would you, what would you share with them to find money in the streets? So we talked a little bit about trusting your gut. I think that's so important. We also talked about that the fact that not only staying grounded, but having gratitude. So these are very important first steps, I, I would say to, to really being able to discover opportunity. Talk to everybody, you know, socialize. And if it's not in you, do the best you can to do it. Maybe it's on social media. Step up and relieve points of friction. Why not? It's free. Go on Facebook and put a 30 second video with an idea. You'd be surprised at the followings that you build. These are things that we need to do. And Greg, what we want to try and really do is come from a point of, of really trying to help others and do good. And if, if your objective is to help other people, to do good, you can't help but the money and the success to come because many people will pick up on that and really be gravitated towards you. You know, being magnetic is really an important thing. And the secret to being magnetic is everyone you come into contact with, make them feel better about themselves and give them something that can help them with value. Now, you can't give what you don't have. So this means that you have to put some work in. You have to put time in to constantly learn, to constantly improve yourself, to constantly grow. And when you do learn these things, don't keep it a secret. Share them with others. The best way to learn is by teaching. It really is. And when we do these things, we become more magnetic. When we're more magnetic, we build a following. When we have a following and a base, and people are going to listen to us. And whether you're selling something, advising people, coaching people, you'll be happier because, yeah, you'll be making more money. And you'll be in a position where you'll be helping others that gives you fulfillment. I do want to say one last thing, and that is get in touch with your why. Many of us leave the house. Right, your, your purpose. Greg, your purpose. When most people yeah. leave in the morning, it's they're busy, they're rushing, they're late, they're either yelling at their kids or on their cell phone or they put the radio on. And that's okay, that's normal. But, but just take a minute here. Tomorrow morning, put a note so you don't forget. What, why am I doing this? And if it's money, don't yeah. be ashamed. Money is a really great thing to do it for. Trust me as someone who is extraordinarily poor, who now has had a little bit of success and can say, wow, things are a lot better when you don't have to worry about money as much. And you could do a lot of good to help others. Maybe it's competition. Compete with yourself. Be the best version of yourself because being the best version of yourself gives you confidence and confidence will draw people to you. Not cockiness, but if you're confident because you know today, right now, your interactions with others are the best version of you. The work that you're doing is the best version. Not 10 years ago, not today. What you're doing right now is the best version of yourself that gives you confidence. And then maybe it's your significant other. Think about that. How powerful would it be to say, well, I want to make a better life for him or her. I want them to be proud of me. Maybe it's your parents that you want to honor. 
because of all the sacrifices that they made to say, wow, you know what? They gave up all this for me. I want to do the best I can today to honor that. Or maybe it's your kids that you go through a brick wall through. How powerful would that be if you held that thought in your mind when you went to work? What in the world could possibly stop you from achieving the goal? Nothing. Well, Barry, it's a pleasure having you on. And thank you for uh, Money in the Streets because it actually helps our listeners remind them that they are enough. And I think more importantly, um, when you walk around with that attitude versus a different attitude that you're not enough, um, you literally, the whole world moves underneath your feet. So thanks for doing that and reminding everybody that they are enough. All they need to do is shift some mindsets about how they look at things and their perceptions. The book does a great job of that. We'll put a link uh, to the book website. Um, I know you have a personal website. Uh, do you want to shout out the book website? Is it up uh, yet? You know, the you could just go to Amazon and pick up the book. I hope you read it. Okay. I hope you enjoy it. And uh, we're at mbshighway.com. But the book okay. will be so meaningful for you. And for those we, will, we will put all of those links in there. Barry, thanks so much for being on. Thanks for sharing this time with my listeners. You're wonderful, Greg. Thank you so Namaste much. Namaste to you, Thank man. you, my brother. Thank you.